Now, in February 2014, so a little over two years ago, Oscar award-winning actor Philip Seymour Hoffman was found dead in his New York apartment with a heroin, heroin needle still stuck in his arm. He was merely 46 years old. Now, a year prior to this, Hoffman played the part of Willie Loman, the disillusioned and empty salesman from the famous play, Death of a Salesman, on Broadway. And uh, in an interview with NPR, Hoffman said, Willie Loman represents the idea that you have a vision of what you're supposed to be, or going to be, or where your kids are going to be. And that doesn't work out. That role had a very personal influence on Hoffman. He said, it really seeps into why we're here. What are we doing? Family, work, friends, hopes, dreams, careers. What's happiness? What does it mean? What's success? Is it important? How do you get it? Ultimately, what gets you up in the morning is to be loved. Hoffman said the play, Death of a Salesman, ultimately comes down to the human desire to be loved and accepted. I think every single one of us knows that desire. I believe it is the driving need that is inside every human being. And I think God put it there. He designed us with a need, with a drive to find love and acceptance with him. That's what we were created for, for that relationship with him. But when we don't find that relationship with God, we look for that love and that acceptance just about anywhere else. And we find ourselves willing to give our whole lives away to almost anything, even if it costs us everything. Now, the fourth century philosopher and theologian Augustine talked about this hunger as well. And he said this about it. Our hearts, uh, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until it rests in you. Augustine is saying we were created for a relationship with God and we have an inner need, an inner drive in all of us to connect with the creator, to find our identity in a relationship with God. And that identity with God is captured by a word that a lot of Christians use and you'll read throughout the New Testament. It's the word righteousness. Now what comes to your mind when I say the word righteousness? Many Christians and non-Christians think of it as a, a measuring word. How righteous are you? Are you good enough? Uh, do you have enough moral obedience, enough purity? Have you done enough good to be righteous? Maybe to please God or maybe just to outrighteous somebody else? We think of it as a measuring word, but righteousness is actually not a measuring word. It's actually a relational word. In the New Testament, righteousness before God means acceptance with God. It asks the question, am I right with God? Am I righteous before him? Does God welcome me? Am I acceptable to him? Without righteousness, without rightness before God, what we have instead is rejection. And we've all known rejection, right? I'm, I'm sure you have. Maybe it was the first big one was that girl who said she wouldn't go to that dance with you. Or maybe it happened when you had a boss who was never satisfied with you or your work. Maybe there was a bully or a group of people who used to make fun of you. Maybe you felt rejected when a parent withheld love from you. Maybe a spouse broke your heart. Maybe you felt rejected when a family member or a close friend betrayed or humiliated you. We've all felt rejection before. It's part of the broken experience we have in this broken world. Rejection kind of confirms what we fear to be true. It's like that voice of shame in our head says, see, you're not loved. You're not worth it. 
Nobody likes you. You're not enough. Who you are and what you've done is unsatisfactory. You are not loved. You are not known. You are not accepted. That's the voice of rejection. And that it crushes that inner desire in us that is always looking for acceptance. Now, whether our souls know it or not, we always look for acceptance from people and in situations, but what our soul longs for most deeply, what we are restless for until we get it, is the acceptance with God. That is ultimately what is at the core of us. And we have rejected God. And by doing so, we have chosen to be rejected by him. The Bible calls this sin. We have chosen to sin, which is a rejection of who God is, of what he has said. We've rejected that relationship, and we've gone our own way. You remember this with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. We've kind of come back to that regularly as we've talked about the gospel, because that's kind of the prototypical sin. Everything that we do kind of comes from there. And when Adam and Eve rejected God, they went and hid in the bushes. They didn't wait around to talk to God. They figured, I'm just going to get rejected by God. My soul can't handle that. So I'm going to go hide in some bushes. And I'm going to go seek acceptance and build an identity elsewhere. But the identity of fig leaves and self-made acceptance can never replace the love that our souls are made for. The love of a father. I'd like to read to you a poem that attempts to get at some of the different ways we humans run from God and seek to find our acceptance in various hiding places. This poem is called Hiding in Fear. Rejection leads to sin and then right back again. Clothed with nothing, covered in shame, we run and hide among the bushes, ignoring his footsteps, not hearing our name. We hide ourselves in perfect bodies, hoping it will fool them all. But a flawless form and perfect skin can't hide the bruises behind our wall. Buried beneath 80 hours of work, we hide in our corner office at night, behind big salaries and bonus checks, afraid our failures might come to light. We hide behind our glorified minds and we reason that no one is after us here. Sinfully, no, uh, our wisdom defends our innocence. Still our souls cry wrapped in fear. We hide ourselves in religious deeds and believe that these could make us right. Sinfully busy, we appear honorably close, but in truth are nowhere near the light. We hide with our warm humanistic thoughts. We cuddle them close to hear once again that everything is indeed about us. And we claim there's no shame, no fear, no sin. We hide in our bush of performance. We doubt that God could forgive our ill. We avoid contact with him at any cost. We hope he won't find us, yet we hope that he will. As Augustine said, at our core, we desire acceptance with God. We long to hear God declare us acceptable, that who we are is enough. And until we get that, our hearts are restless. And we know that things aren't the way they should be. No human needs to be told that. We know we're not exactly what we're supposed to be. Things aren't the way they were meant to be. Sin has affected the world. It's affected us. But that desire to be accepted by God doesn't go away. We still have that drive to be accepted by God. And when we don't have God's acceptance, what do we do? How do we meet that drive? Well, as human beings, when we don't have God's acceptance, we try to establish acceptance on our own. The Apostle Paul, who is a famous follower of Christ in Romans chapter 10, verse 3 he says this about a group of really religious people who were trying to earn their way into God's acceptance. In Romans 10 verse 3, he says, Since they, this group, did not know the righteousness of God and they sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. 
In other words, they didn't understand the acceptance that God was offering to them. And they sought to establish their own rightness, their own acceptableness. They were finding a way to be right with themselves, but ultimately finding a way to try and be right with God. Now, what does that look like to make a, to to try and build a righteousness on your own? Well, I think humans, we tend to do that in two ways. Number one, we try to build our acceptance, establish an acceptance apart from God. This is where we go pursue the things of the world, seeking acceptance and identity in those things. We pursue career success, academic achievement, financial goals. We live in the right neighborhoods. We dress the right way. We look the right way. And it doesn't uh, help us that the whole world has seemed to be aiming messages at us saying, this is what it means to be accepted. This is what it means to have that which you long for. It means to drive this car. It means you live in this neighborhood. It means you go to that school. It's difficult. But that's what we do. We throw ourselves into the world thinking that there, somewhere out in the bushes, we're going to find the acceptance that our hearts long for. On the other side, a way we try to establish acceptance on our own is we try to establish acceptance with God. But we're still the ones who are trying to do it in our own effort. This is the way of religion. If this is the way of irreligion without God, this is the path of religion. That there is a way you can do enough. There is a way you can work and work hard enough to make yourself acceptable to God. If you go to church enough, if you read your Bible enough, if you believe hard enough, if you do the right things, say the right things, avoid the bad people, avoid the bad things, then you'll be acceptable to God. Both of these paths are folly. Both of them fall short of being acceptable to God. Our hearts don't get what they want in either path. You see, because everything we've talked about so far can either be gained or lost. This is based on our performance or our circumstances. Your looks can change. You can lose a job. A relationship can end. And all your religious list-keeping can fail. And when that happens, the identity we've tried to establish on our own topples down. And what we end up doing is we build our identity then based out of fear because we know these are unstable places to build our identity. An example of some of the ways we let fear then control us into trying to establish a righteousness and acceptableness. For example, we fear if I'm not needed, then I'm not loved. So we build an identity around being needed. Or we fear if I don't take care of myself, no one else will. So we build an identity around being self-sufficient. Or we fear that we don't have what it takes. So to make up for that, we try to appear strong, or we focus all our energies in getting good at one thing, thinking that will make up for all of our failures in other parts of life. Or we fear that we can't perform well enough to feel worthy, so we build an identity around accomplishment. Or we fear that if we're vulnerable, we're going to get hurt. So we build an identity around not letting anyone else in. And so we go through life throwing out anger and confusion, responding to others out of insecurity and need, constantly looking for acceptance, constantly looking for identity. The good news is it doesn't have to be that way. The good news of the gospel is that God is reconciling all things to himself. We talked about that last week. That's the single sentence definition we're using throughout this series on the good news. God's reconciling all things to himself. That means you can have an acceptance and identity with God in Christ. There is reconciliation. It is possible for you to have acceptance and identity, that which your heart longs for most deeply but it's only available to you in Christ. Let's go back to that passage in Romans 10. Let me read verse four with it. So we have Romans 10, verse three. I'll read it again. And then this time read verse four too. 
Since they, this group of people trying to establish righteousness on their own, did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. The good news is that Jesus fulfilled the law. Where we have failed, where we have rejected God, he has been faithful. He has followed God all the way to the cross. And on the cross, he died for all the ways you and I have failed. He bore the rejection that was ours. And by doing that, by us, he, by, by him doing that, it makes it possible for us to have that reconciled relationship with the Father. We believe. When we believe, when we accept this gift of reconciliation that's offered to us in Jesus, we put our faith in what Jesus has done for us. What God then does is he puts us in Christ. And when he looks at Christ, he sees you and me. And when he looks at you and me, he sees Christ. And what's true about him is true about you and me. Paul says elsewhere in Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4, he says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. You have in Christ acceptance and identity. The way home to God, the way to get that which your heart and soul are longing for, is faith in Christ. It's not effort. It's not you doing. It's not you doing the right things, saying the right things, holding your mouth the right way when you, you know, you're in church, making sure God's happy with you. No. In a great book called The Cure, what, uh, it's, what if God isn't who you think he is and neither are you? It's one of the best books on grace I've probably ever read. As you see, it's a nice Scott-sized book, very thin. And this is what the authors say to those of us who are wandering, which is all of us, who have rejected God, who have left home and are trying to find our way back. He says, the way home is not effort, not amends, and not heroic promise. The way home is trusting what God paid to cleanse me. This life in Christ is not about what I can do to make myself worthy of his acceptance, but about daily trusting what he has done to make me worthy of his acceptance. Christ has already accomplished everything. He has fulfilled the law. He is the only person without fails without failures, who could therefore stand in the place of our failure. He could bear the rejection that was ours so we can have the acceptance that is his. You see, Jesus invites you and me to be reconciled to the Father, saying, I am accepted. I have a right relationship. I have the righteousness before the Father. And if you put your faith in me, that righteousness will be yours. That acceptance with the Father will be yours. The identity that you seek will be yours. That is the good news. Our old attempts at constructing an identity and seeking acceptance apart from God are dead. Now our life is in Christ, and Christ is our life, as Colossians 3, 3, and 4 say. And whatever God feels about Jesus, he feels about you. If you've put your faith in Christ, you are accepted. You are beloved. You are secure as a child of God. You have an identity. Who are you? You are Christ. Is Christ in you? Your life is hidden with him and his life is now being lived through you. That's the good news of the gospel. That's what the gospel is inviting us to do, to put and find our acceptance and our identity in Christ. We're accepted because he was accepted. I'd like to share with you two stories of two people who believed this and had their lives changed. The first person is a man who lived about 2,000 years ago, and the second person is a man in this church. So the first one is the Apostle Paul. You've heard me quote him a few times today, but I wonder how many of you really know his story. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into the whole thing, but I'll let him tell you a little bit of his story in Philippians chapter 3, 
um, verses 4 through 6. Now, Paul was like the height of religious rule keeper in the first century. I mean, he was as good as it got, as faithful as it came. And he was battling for that acceptance with God that we all battle for. And he was trying to build it on his own effort. Read what he says in Philippians 3. He calls this acceptance with God. He, the term he uses is confidence in the flesh. He says, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. Look, you don't have to understand all the religious jargon in there to understand this. Paul was serious about trying to establish his identity with God based on his circumstances and his performance. But what Paul found out is what so many of us find out who make religious behavior the means of acceptance with God. Paul found out you can never be good enough. You can't even keep your own standards, much less God's. But Paul found a gift. He found a gift in Jesus Christ. The next few verses he goes on to say, in Philippians 3 verse 7, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but a righteousness in Christ. The, that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul saying, whatever I thought I was gaining by being good enough, by the road of religion, back to God, I, I consider that worthless. It, it was good stuff to do, but it was worth jack squat for getting rid of the fear of the rejection and the insecurity and the lack of acceptance I felt inside of me. And yes, jack squat's in the Greek. <laughs> but Paul found something better. He encountered an acceptance with God that is not based on being good enough because there is no good enough that we could ever bring that would be good enough. His acceptance with God, his new identity is based squarely on what Christ has done. Rather than his good works, his acceptance with God is based on Christ's good works on the cross. That reconciliation that is made possible. Paul decided to find his acceptance and identity in Christ and it changed everything. His entire way of life got turned upside down. He said, I consider it worthless compared to the acceptance I have with God in Christ. Now, the second person to tell you about is a man who gave me permission to share his story. He grew up in church. At a very young age, had put his faith in Jesus. He had very godly parents. He understood very young enough about the gospel and salvation to know, believe in Jesus and you avoid hell and all that bad stuff. Like, I think he understood hell also to be a place where like ice cream melts before you can eat it. You know, really terrible stuff when you're four or five years old. But as he grew older, nobody told him this, but this young man came to believe that God would be more pleased with him if he kept the rules a little better, if he prayed a little more, if he read his Bible a little longer, if, if he behaved a little better, surely God would be more pleased with him. And he started to buy into this idea that he could make God more or less happy based on his performance. It didn't take long for this young man to then take this view of God and project that on his fellow humans as well, on his family, on his friends, eventually on his spouse. Psychologists call this disposition performance-based acceptance. It's the belief that we think we need to perform in order to be accepted. 
by God as well as others. And this young man bought into it. And he lived that way. And he kind of constructed a mask that was based on right behavior and performance. And he always struggled to receive acceptance and love because, well, he would built this mask. And all the love and the acceptance fell onto the mask that he'd created rather than coming through and him being able to feel it himself. It all fell on the persona he created. As he got into his adult years, he started to realize this is a warped view of God. And it has no origins in the gospel. Because God is a God who says there is nothing you can do to make yourself more or less acceptable. Because once you've put your faith in me, I've put you in Christ. And my son's acceptance with me does not go up and down. It is secure. And one day, this man decided to believe that. He decided to believe it not just up here, but to believe it right here. That his acceptance and identity really was in Christ. That there really was nothing else he could do to make God love him any more or any less. And his life began to change. Instead of fearing rejection from God and walking on eggshells and always trying to perform and base his identity on his performance, he began to receive love and grace from God. He felt joy and freedom in his life. It also freed him to accept love from other people because the mask was gone. He was now able to give and receive love because he learned to receive the love of the Father. It changed everything for this man, all because he changed his beliefs. He believed that the gospel was true, that the good news was reality, that he did have acceptance and a new identity in Christ, changed his marriage, changed his relationship with his kids and his friends, and most importantly, affected his relationship with the Father. Now, this guy's not perfect now. He will tell you he still struggles with sins. There's still problems. He's still working this out. But things are definitely different for him. He's living in joy and grace and freedom, no longer in a fear of rejection, no longer constantly trying to perform in order to earn something more from God or from others. Now, the reason I know so much about this man is that you're looking at him. That's my story. And I'm telling you, I have personally had my world changed upside down when I actually believed this to be true. And that's why I am passionate about the gospel. That is why I'm passionate about teaching and preaching this good news as the foundation of everything else. This is what it means to be a believer. We do not rest anything on our performance or our circumstances. We base it on Christ's performance on our behalf. He has made us acceptable with God. He has given us a new identity. And the gospel this morning is inviting you and it's inviting me to find our acceptance and identity in Christ. Some of you have never done that. You could do that this morning. You can reach out to God and pray in your own words. Say, God, I believe this to be true. I accept your gift of salvation. I want to be reconciled to you And I put my faith in Jesus. I believe he died in my place. I believe there's nothing I could do to get rid of my sin. But I believe he took it in my place so that I could have acceptance with you, righteousness before you. Some of you maybe need to step forward into this truth. Others of you, many of you in this room, you've already believed this. Your salvation is secure. This is who you are. But I have to ask you, only because I've been there myself, friend to friend. Have you drifted from this truth? Are you falling back into believing that your performance and your circumstances make you acceptable to God? Are you still trying to build an identity out there in the bushes rather than accepting the identity that you have in Christ? He's got a house fully set up. You could go try and build your own or you could just move into the one he built you that says, child of God, beloved. Have you drifted from the truth? 
If so, I invite you to come back. Step back into the belief, into the gospel, into the good news that you are already fully accepted. You are fully known. You are fully loved. And you have no fear of rejection before God. And that is enough for your soul. Let me repeat that. You can come to God. You can be fully known, fully loved, fully accepted, with no fear of rejection. And that is enough for your heart and for your soul. That is what we long for most deeply. So whether you're needing to step forward into this for the first time, or maybe you're just wanting to step back into this truth this morning, I'd invite you to pray with me. Dear God, I know that I've tried to build an identity around things other than you, and I've sought acceptance elsewhere. I see that now as sin. Please forgive me. I believe in Jesus' death and resurrection as being for me. I believe that in Christ I am accepted by you. That Jesus gives me a new identity and declares me righteous before you. Please show me, Father, how this truth matters in my life. Help me to become the person whom you have already made me to be in your son. Help me to trust and continually find my acceptance and identity is in you. Pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.